He is worthy to be praised. And that's what it's about. It's Palm Sunday. It's a happy day, right? It's about praising Jesus, right? That's what they were doing. It's a welcoming party. It's a great day. I mean, but nothing beats a good old military homecoming, right? Nothing beats a good old military homecoming. I mean, you've seen them on YouTube. You've seen the mom and dads coming home. You've seen them surprising the kids. You've seen them getting honored coming home. Nothing beats that. And me being in the military for 20 years, right, I got to experience a lot of those, right? Multiple times coming home, being welcomed. Even coming home from the hospital, I was able to come home and surprise each one of my kids. And my daughter would say, Dad, are you home home? And I'm like, I'm home home. You know, and it was just so great. But one of the best homecomings, welcomings that I can remember was my last deployment. Going overseas, serving, coming back, we decided to surprise the kids at PDQ, which if you haven't been there, shameless plug, great restaurant. All right, so, but we went to surprise them there. Rachel, Annalise, and my wife, Rach, went and picked me up from the base, which left Jeff and Joey trying to wrangle up 10 kids. I wish I could have been there to see that happen and bring them to PDQ. So we got to PDQ first. I'm hiding in the back. The kids come. I come out. Sereno kids, your dad's home. And it's just great welcoming, right? They're screaming. They're yelling. The kids are running up to me. This video goes viral. I'm shaking hands with people. All these things are happening, and it's all because I came home, right? That doesn't compare to what we see when Jesus comes into Jerusalem here. It doesn't even compare. I can't even wrap my head around what we see. And that's what I want to kind of talk about today is the road coming into there. But what happened before that? Because it's super important. If we don't read about that, we can miss out on a lot of things. So before we get going, Father God, I give you the glory and the honor and the praise and everything, Father, because you are worthy of it all. All hail to you, King Jesus, Father. We give this service to you. We give everything to you. I pray that your words are heard and not mine, Father God. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see what it is that you have for us, God. We give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So once again, it doesn't compare to what we see here. But... Jesus wasn't about that. That wasn't what he was all about. You could see multiple times he did not want them to make him king yet because they didn't get it. They were looking for that earthly king, and he didn't want to do that. You could see multiple times he run away, he go away, he he escaped from them before they were able to. In John 6, 15, we see this. So Jesus, aware that they intended to come and take him by force to make him king. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. So this was right after he fed the 5,000, right? This is right after they saw this. This is right before he walked on water. And he's like, no, you're not taking me. He can see this happen, and he's like, you're not taking me. It's not time yet. It's not the Father's will yet for this to be happened. But this time, as he's riding into Jerusalem, right, this time he would allow it. He would allow it all to play out. He would boldly declare by fulfilling prophecy that we see in Zechariah 9.9. And it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What's really amazing about this is this was fulfilled to the day. Go do a study on it. You can find it in Daniel 9. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but when there's a revelation study that comes up, we'll dig into it. But in in Daniel 9, he talks about 70 weeks. He talks about this. He says that from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks, which if you do the math, each week is seven years, 483 years. In the calendar back then was 360 days. You do the math, 173,880 days to the day Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. God's time, yeah, God's timing is perfect. He doesn't miss, right? So he allows it to play out, right, to fulfill the prophecy. It was his timing for this to happen. So you see, he's done talking about it now. He's done teaching about what's going to happen. It's time to put action, 
right? And I titled this, me- this message, The Word in Action, right? Word in Action. So let's look to see what led up to this triumphal entry, why this triumphal entry, all that happens with it, right? So Jesus has talked about it three times now to them by this point, what was going to happen. You see it in Mark 8. You see it in Mark 9. The disciples don't get it. They're even scared to ask about it. They're afraid. And then you see it again in Mark 10. He's talking about what's to come. So the very first account is in Mark 8. And we see him talking to the disciples for the first time about what's to come. And he asks them and he says, but who do you say that I am? It's a very plain question. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise from the dead. He was stating the matter plainly. Plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter rebukes him. So he's making this statement clearly to him, right? But you got to remember, this is the first time Jesus is teaching about this. This is the first time Peter's hearing about this. And Peter can't comprehend the Messiah, suffering, death. What does this all mean? And he starts to pull him away and starts to rebuke him. How many times in our life does Jesus speak so plainly to us, trying to teach us something so plainly, right? And we're like, nah, that can't be right. You've missed it, right? Like you don't, right? He's looking at us and speaking plainly to us. And we're like, nah, I don't don't think about that. What does Jesus say? Right? But turning around, seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but on man's. You are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but on man's. Right? And then he goes on to teach him this in 34. And he summoned the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's sacrifice. It's sacrifice is what he's talking about. Sacrifice daily in order to focus on godly things. Not on our own man purposes, but on God's purposes. It's not wrong to have desires and wants, but it's wrong to have the desires with the wrong heart. Or desire after the wrong things for the wrong purposes. So then we see Jesus teach on this again, right? Let's go to Luke. You see this story of him teaching in all the gospels. In three of the gospels, you see him talking about the healings, right? In all four gospels, you see the triumphal entry, right? So you see this in multiple gospels. So in Luke, in chapter 18, he's now talking to them the last time. For the third time about what's to come, right? We see him teach for the last time here. And this is what he says in verse 31. He took the 12 aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all the things that have been written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He'll be ridiculed and abused and spit upon. And after they have flogged him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Listen what happens here now. The disciples understood none of these things and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them and they did not comprehend the things that were said. They had no idea what this meant. This is the third time that he's teaching on this and it's still hidden. They still can't comprehend the Messiah, the son of man, the son coming, right? And now he's going to suffer. He's going to die. What does this all mean to us, right? They just can't comprehend this and the same story is told in mark 10 and i want to read that story because mark adds something to the end of it so in mark 10 verse 31 all right 32 now they were on the road going up to jerusalem and jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were fearful And again, he took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen. 
saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests, the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise from the dead. So the same thing we see written in Luke, right? We see written in Mark. But Mark adds something here. Right after he gets done teaching about this, you see in here, you see John and James. So Jesus just taught for the third time he's going to suffer He's going to die. He's going to be handed over. He's going to be mocked. He's going to rise on the third day. And now you see James and John in verse 35. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? This is what they said. Grant that we may sit, one on your right, one on your left, in your glory. They just wanted power, right? They're still thinking in this earthly realm of Jesus coming to serve or coming to reign as king on this earth, and they wanted the power. They wanted to sit on the left and the right. They wanted the the wrong heart was behind what they wanted, like I talked about, right? They didn't realize, though, that one day they were going to rule and reign with Jesus when he came back as Savior of the earth on the last day when he came back here for the last time, right? They didn't understand that. They weren't ready to make him the Lord of their lives yet in that way. In Mark 10, right after he gets done talking to them about, hey, you can't have this. You can't have the baptism that I'm going to be baptized in. You aren't going to suffer in the suffering that I'm suffering in, right? I can't let you sit on the left or right. That's not up to me. That's the Father's will. And now the disciples are arguing about this. You can imagine, right? Two of them wanting to sit on the left and the right, raising a fuss about it. And now they're arguing over this. And this is what Jesus says to them. Verse 42, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles domineer over them. Their people in high position exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Rather, whoever wants to become prominent among you shall be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This right here is what it's all about. We're called to serve, right? We're not called to get served. Even though I can remember coming home and those welcoming parties, it wasn't about that, right? It's about serving. That's what we're called to serve. I just talked about a sacrifice. Serving is a sacrifice, Right? You're giving up your time, but you always have to do it with the right heart. You can even serve for a lifetime, but without the wrong heart and the wrong, you got the wrong motives going, it's not going to be of any use. You have to have the right heart. So why did I talk about all this? Why did I talk about Jesus teaching and Jesus with serving and all these things? Because if you don't talk about this and you don't look at this, you're going to miss out on the miracle And what happens during that miracle on the road to Jerusalem and all the things that surround that. It's so important to read other parts. You can't just read one little snippet and then get everything out of it. So now, on the road into Jerusalem is where we find the miracle we're going to talk about today. So he has so many people following him right now, right? So he's got so many people. He's got people following him that have heard about the raising of Lazarus, that's seen the raising of Lazarus. They've got, he's got people just following him because it's that time to go up to Jerusalem, right? So he's got so many people on the road with him. You can just think about all the things that, that are going on, right? Some of the people that are following him are still looking for this earthly king to take away this temporary pain, this temporary problem that they have. They haven't put their faith, hope, and trust in him yet as the one that's going to rule and reign forever. That could be some of us in here, right? We may have looked to Jesus to, to take away some of that stuff, but haven't truly made him the Lord of our lives, right? Truly given our lives over to him and confessed that he is our Lord and Savior. It's not too late. It's not too late. You're going to see here as well. So as they're on the road, you can imagine Jesus knows he's going to get crucified. How do we know? He just taught about it three times, right? So we know he knows what's going on. 
We know the stress that he's under in that situation because we can see later on in the garden, he's literally sweating blood, right? So this is a very stressful situation. This, he knows what's coming. He knows the will that has to happen. He's got all these people around him. So you can just imagine he's probably focused. I, I'm watching a hockey game. I can't focus on other things around me, right? I'm watching a hockey game. My kids can ask me a question and probably get whatever they want, right? You can imagine the things that are going on with this walk that's going. He's probably so laser focused or there's so much things going on he couldn't even hear something small that's going on to distract him, right? But he does. He hears something. He hears something. Luke 18. This is where we're going to find the miracle that we're going to talk about. Luke 18, 35. Now as Jesus was approaching Jericho, a man who was blind was sitting by the road begging But when he heard a crowd going by, he began inquiring what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Have you heard that before? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, regain your sight, your faith has made you well. You see a different outcome this time when you hear that statement. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. When all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. This is word in action. I mean, this is literally what the series is about. This is literally Jesus' stories and taking it to the streets. He just taught about serving, right? He just told them that, we're gotta be a, that we need to be a servant, right? He just told them about it, and now he's literally taking it to the streets and showing them what it is that he's talking about. And that's what we want from this series. That's what we're talking about. We want to be able to take what is taught, what we learn, and take it to the streets and not just keep it here. Amen? And that's what we're talking about. So others' needs in front of our own. Not meaning in an unhealthy way, though, right? I'm talking about when it's to further the kingdom, we need to choose to further the kingdom over our desires, our own wants. We are called to serve. So this man sitting next to the road is blind, right? In those days, a castaway. Basically rejected by society, useless, sitting by the side of the road, right? And he heard what was going on and called out. It's important. You can miss that part. The disciples have been with him for how long? They've seen him feed the 5,000. They've seen him walk on water. They've seen him calm the storms. They've seen him deliver a man and send the demon into the pigs. They've seen all these things happen. And sometimes they still can't comprehend who he is. They still doubt who he is. How many times have people today have seen what he can miraculously do and we doubt and we still wonder, is that really him? The Pharisees saw what he was, going, what he was doing and still wanted to kill him and to destroy him, right? But this man, this man heard about the feeding of the 5,000. He heard about the walking on the water. He heard about calming the storm. He heard about others being healed from, uh, healed. Um, He's heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead. He's heard about all these things. He didn't see it. He just heard it. And then he hears Jesus is coming, right? And knows that this is Jesus. And what does he do? He cries out, son of David, This shows he truly believes that he is the Messiah. He truly believes that he can heal him because he knows the sign of the Messiah coming is that he's going to give sight to the blind. And if he can surely raise Lazarus from the dead, he can heal this man. And he's heard of other healings that have happened and he truly knows this is the Son of Man. So as he cried out, Son of David, People around him, right, people leading the way with Jesus tried to quiet him, tried to tell him to be quiet. (laughs) So he's crying out, 
son of David, and people are telling him to be quiet. We need to be careful on who we tell to be quiet. We need to be careful on, if they're calling out to Jesus, not to tell them to be quiet. Because as he cried out, right, maybe they didn't want Jesus to be bothered. Maybe they thought he was too focused on what's going on. They didn't want to bother him with all this stuff. But in the midst of Jesus going to going into Jerusalem, in the midst of him knowing what's coming, in the midst of all the stress in his life, this is what he does. He tells them to go bring him to me. So the same people that he just told that person to be quiet, he's now telling them, no, no, go get him and bring him to me. In Mark it says that those people that he told to go get him, right, it says that in Mark he tells them to stand up. He's calling you. Come to him. We need to be careful not to quiet someone that's calling out to Jesus. He's calling out to each one of us right now. Each one of us need to jump up and follow after the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our soul. You may be calling out to him right now and you may think that he doesn't hear you. Because there's so much stuff going on, he hears you. You may be calling out and you've had people try to silence you. Tell you to be quiet. You shouldn't be doing this family members, co-workers, whoever it is, right, telling you, nah, you don't need to be doing that. You need to be quiet. You need to stop doing this stuff. What are you doing? What are you looking for, right? But no, what's this guy do? <laughs> he yells louder, right? He gets loud. He just says this. In, uh, in 34, it says he just gets, he just gets louder at it, right? So here it says, those who led were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more. Right? He kept crying out all the more. So I'm here to tell you he hears you. Keep crying out. Right? Don't let somebody quiet you. Right? Some of us in here know people that need to be told, take courage, stand up. He is calling you. Maybe we need to go bring someone to Jesus like Jesus just told them to go bring and maybe it's somebody you just told to be quiet or you had an argument with. He's going to tell you to go bring them to me. No better time than this week to reach out to somebody to bring them to church. Right? More people are likely to come during Christmas and Easter time. I encourage you to reach out to those that need Jesus. The important part is Jesus would have just walked by. He was on the way to Jerusalem. right? He would have just walked by. But this man yelled out to Jesus. There's always a faith action that needs to be had. His faith action was crying out to Jesus, son of David. This man cried out and Jesus stopped and had him brought to him. Then Jesus asked him that same question. What do you want me to do for you? And we see a total different outcome than what we saw with John and James. Right? A lot different conversation than what Jesus had with them. It is always about God's will, not our own, and our aligning ourselves with his. It's for the right heart, the right purpose of what we're asking for and what we're, what we're wanting. It's a heart issue. James and John wanted power. All this man wanted to do was have his sight. And he knew that the Son of Man could do it. But Jesus knew already what this guy wanted. It wasn't a surprise. It wasn't like Jesus was like, oh, you want your sight back. It wasn't a shock to him. He already knows what you want. He already knows your request. But he's giving you the opportunity to make that request known. And the blind man said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Jesus said, regain your sight. Your faith has made you well. And this is what he did. As soon as he was healed, this is what he did. Immediately the blind man began following Jesus and glorifying God. Do you hear that? He got his sight back, he was healed, and all he wanted to do was glorify God and follow after him. All praise to God, and then everyone that saw that praised God as well. So even John and James, who were there, who heard exactly the same question being asked to this castaway, this blind man sitting on the side of the road, the same question asked to them, John and James heard, and they still gave praise because this man was healed. But they didn't get what they wanted. But they still gave praise to Jesus. Do you hear that? And that's exactly what we want here at Journey. 
We want all glory and honor and praise. I mean, you heard the songs we were singing today. All glory and honor, praise to him. Because it's truly all about him. It isn't about anything that we do. It isn't about anything that we say. It's only about what he says and what he does. And that's what we want to do is to glorify him daily. Take these God encounters and give them away and glorify him and praise him. That's exactly how I want to end service today. That's how I want to end service is by glorifying and worshiping Jesus. Just giving him glory for all that he has done, that he's going to do, that he's already done for us. Just giving him that glory and that honor. So as the worship band comes up here, I want you to rise to your feet with me. And I I just want you to close your eyes right now. Just focus on this story that we just talked about.